and federal agents capture Machine Gun Kelly. Seized with Kelly is his wife, Catherine, and arrangements are made to move both to Oklahoma City for trial. Kelly, wanted for murder in three cities, high on the list of public enemies, and suspected leader of the kidnap gang, which held oil millionaire Charles Urschel for $200,000 ransom, is to face a jail sentence with seven others. At the Oklahoma City courthouse, the mother and stepfather of Kelly's wife, along with five others, are about to be tried under the so-called Lindbergh federal law. This is Charles Urschel, the kidnapped victim, who sees his captors in court. Kelly and the others await sentence by federal judge vote. The defendants will please stand. It's the judgment of this court that Harvey J. Bailey be sentenced to the federal penitentiary for the term of his natural life. It's the judgment of this court that R.G. Shannon... Newsreel cameras and recorders are allowed for the first time at a federal trial as Judge Vought proceeds to impose penalties on the defendants. The All of them are found guilty and sentenced to life imprisonment. ...for the term of her natural life. The marshal will retire with the prisoner. A movement led by Attorney General Homer S. Cummings and by special arrangement with the War Department converts Alcatraz Island in the Pacific into a federal penitentiary. And it is here that Machine Gun Kelly is to be brought. Alcatraz, impregnable fortress since its erection as a military prison in 1858, awaits only notice that the government has closed its case before it closes its doors on Machine Gun Kelly. At Exmoor Country Club, Highland Park, Illinois, September 1933, here's Helen Hicks driving long one down fairway. Then, blasting ball from Sand Trap in tough match against Virginia Van Wee of Chicago. Virginia is keen on repeating as woman's national golf champion. So's her putting. That one was 35 feet long. It's closed till mid-afternoon when two girls approach last green with Virginia well ahead. It's a putt and miss for Helen Hicks and handshake from good loser for Miss Van Wee. Four up and three to go, Virginia Van Wee is still champ of women golfers. Here in Plymouth, Vermont, Independence Day, 1872, Calvin Coolidge is born. His home is in rear of this country store. As a boy, this is the school in which he learns his ABCs. His college, Amherst. Here he studies law. After graduation in 1895, he practices law in these Northampton, Massachusetts offices. In 1910, he moves into Northampton City Hall as mayor. He's now a husband and father of two boys, John and Calvin, Jr. Then in 1919, he's governor of his state. But fate has bigger things in store for Calvin Coolidge. He's Republican candidate for vice president of the United States in 1920. And with Warren Harding, wins election. First vice president to attend his chief's cabinet meetings. He's well prepared for this. Harding dies. On 2nd of August, 1923, Calvin Coolidge becomes his nation's 29th president. With his wife, he receives congratulations from his friends and neighbors. He's warm beneath stern exterior, a popular executive, no accidental president either. In 1924, he heads Republican ticket and wins election on his own. Crowds cheer his inauguration and hear one of the few speeches by our president famous as a man of few words. Thrifty New Englander, he fashions an administration that cuts government spending, wards off waste. He's perfect president for the times. And times are perfect too, for prosperity is not just around the corner, but here. And armies of workers are marching daily to ever-increasing jobs. Here is the busy market of New York Stock Exchange. It's the era of prowess too. Charles A. Lindbergh leaps Atlantic, and Coolidge gives his friend Lindy one of the nation's highest honors. And honors come to Coolidge. In South Dakota, he's made Indian chief and says of coming election, I do not choose to run. 
In March 1929, he hands helm of the nation to fellow Republican Herbert Clark Hoover and retires to private life. Then, January 5th, 1933, in his Northampton home, he dies. A stunned America mourns his sudden passing. Mrs. Coolidge and surviving son John attend the simple services. But the sorrow is nationwide, for Calvin Coolidge was not just president, but a symbol of good feeling in a world that for a time was doing all right. Here on visit to New Orleans in middle 1920s is Vice President Charles Dawes, his famous upside down pipe, and Mrs. Dawes. Famed author of Dawes' plan for Germany's payment of war debts, Dawes was one of our most illustrious vice presidents. Here's the Navy's handsome Lieutenant Commander Zachary Lansdowne in 1925, ranking officer of ill-fated Shenandoah. Aboard the R-34, Lansdowne was first American to fly Atlantic. He died in crash of Shenandoah, same year this picture was taken. Here left is Harlan F. Stone in 1925 with famed Speaker of the House, Uncle Joe Cannon. Attorney General of United States, Stone has just been appointed Associate Justice of the Supreme Court by President Calvin Coolidge. Yes, here's Harlan Stone in 1925. It's 23rd of July, 1925, and here's Chicago's brand new Union Station. Railroad and Windy City dignitaries lead more than 500 on tour of the terminal, which covers three acres of Chicago's most valuable land. Here are Samuel Ree of Pennsylvania Railroad, Chicago's Mayor Deaver, and construction engineer J.D. Esposito. July 23rd is officially opening day but station had already been in use for six weeks, with four railroads serving 50,000 people daily, with travelers going to and from city on pleasure and business, or both. Nation's second largest city, Chicago is world's greatest rail center, and here in 1925, it adds new and beautiful terminal to its collection of railroad stations serving the American millions who travel by train. At Swank, Southampton, Long Island, in the middle 20s, society's most social and the royally rich hold a benefit to raise money for a hospital. These cigarette girls are heiresses, and these highly treasured young women bury treasure for children to find, for a fee. At own booth, Mrs. Enrico Caruso helps her famed husband with the decorations, and here the famous artist is sketching the famed social beauty, Mrs. Orrin Root. She's pretty as a picture, too. Here are wealthy waitresses, the Mrs. McKay, Ogden, and Crack. And here, the children of the rich enjoy a tent show that has all the trimmings of a full-fledged circus, even the tent. Acrobats raise cane with the law of gravity, while mid-twenties socialites raise money for a worthy cause. But the fun didn't get anything from these admissions. They're in for free. It's 1925, and on top of less active 16-inch cannon, sailors are going great guns learning how to get along with dance in their pants. Instructress is Miss Gail Beverly, and what she's teaching our Navy is how to wiggle out of any situation. In case you haven't already guessed, this choreographer's catastrophe is called the Black Bottom. sure her pupils get a kick out of her work. Getting her students down, teacher twirls herself dizzy trying to keep them that way. It's a stilt walking contest in Chicago. Time, middle 1920s. Windy City youngsters are all up in air about it too. And here's a demonstration of how to do battle in an elevated way. This contestant calls himself greatest man on stilts. Bet he's never late for school. Annual affair is under auspices of Chicago Board of Education. 
and there are prizes for entrance with most educated stilts. It's February 21st, 1925, and with designer Igor Sikorsky in cockpit, giant passenger plane is ready for test flight from Roosevelt Field, Westbury, Long Island. Sikorsky watches as 11 passengers enter his big ship for a trip which will take them for 100 mile an hour jaunt over city of New York. It's all aboard as famed ex-Russian flyer does another successful pioneering job for aviation. And here's another success for big ships. On coast of England, August 9th, 1925, huge flying boat is prepared for takeoff. British Air Minister Sir Samuel Hoare is aboard and gigantic cloud cutter will attempt flight through dangerous skies of North Sea. Takeoff is without incident, and so is the flight. At Bayshore Park, Maryland, October 1925, wreckage of Navy planes litters waters, results of storm-like winds of day before. This doesn't delay race for Schneider Cup. But England's Captain Baird and his mystery plane have bad luck on test hop. It's no plane and no contest for Captain. He's on sidelines as race begins, with ships taxiing into bay at five minute intervals. For seaplanes only, race is expected to create new world's record, with some of aviation's best pilots at controls of ships. Here's America's Jimmy Doolittle shortening the distance between two points and risking dangerous blackouts to bank around turns of closed course. He's home in record time, too, clocked at more than 232 miles an hour. Winner and holder of another new world's record for flying, Jimmy Doolittle. Here's immortal member of our once great fleet of lighter than aircraft. And here in Bermuda's Hamilton Harbor, Ship Potoka offers mooring. It's April 22nd, 1925, as dirigible Los Angeles makes more aviation history. For this, his first time airship has been moored at sea. Here on flight from Lakehurst, New Jersey, dirigible took off at six this morning. We'll refuel at Harbor Mooring and be home by nine tonight. Flying firecrackers. Here in mid-twenties is biggest thing in bombers and bombs. With ink for history of World War I still wet, Pilots demonstrate power they'll carry aloft in any future war. Bombs boast 300 pounds of death and destruction, our big advance over hand-dropped explosives of recent European war. In test flight, America's then last word in airborne battlecraft, wing over target, and it's bombs away. Bombs burst on target with what warriors of time consider top flight destruction. But even with stick of 1920 bombs, damage is nothing compared with lone missile destined to be hung on Hiroshima. But long before atom bomb of World War II, veterans of World War I were making a pretty big noise. The teapot dome case. A senatorial investigation follows in the wake of the disposal of a naval oil lease in California. Foreman Johnson of Fall Ranch, New Mexico. Senate Committee Member Walsh of Montana. Secretary of the Navy, Denby. The committee in session finds Walsh questioning Will Hayes, and Hayes' testimony proves vital in the case. Initial bombshell is thrown by Harry Sinclair, oil magnate, who indicates his willingness to testify, but later refuses. Owen J. Roberts is appointed government counsel, whose target in the investigation is former Secretary of the Interior, Albert B. Fall. Fall, with Edward L. Doheny, suspected of bribery, leaves Supreme Courthouse in Washington, D.C. It is the former secretary, on the right here, who is to be convicted of accepting Doheny's bribe of $100,000 for the leasing of the Elks Hill Naval Oil Reserve. In the latest fashion of the year, voyagers waved fashionable farewells. The seagoing male wore a cap, white shirt, striped jacket, and light-colored trousers, and wired home for more money. And peacetime warfare was confined to pillow fights. 
As evidence, here are a couple of tars being feathered. Dining at the captain's table was the highlight of the journey, even back in 1926. Notice the lady now smokes, and the captain wears his World War I award. There was a Spanish influence in attire at the fancy dress ball. And these onlookers watched a gathering of dancers dressed in the flowing robes and colors of peacetime Spain, as vacationers of 1926 had fun on the bounding main. The millinery show in Chicago back in 1926. It's been revived since, but it still makes you think of Clarabeau, the Charleston, and Flappers. So do those low-waisted, high-skirted dresses. These were the halcyon days for millinery before the threat of hatlessness. The jet-trimmed satin helmet looks like a fugitive from the football gridiron. So does the model. Miles and Marathon. It's April 20th, 1926. And here's famed Boston Marathon in early stages, with all 88 starters still in the race. But as time and the yards go by, many of the early pacemakers drop out. And into lead in Boston streets goes John Miles, crossing line a winner. 18 years old, Miles wins first marathon he enters. Second behind young Miles is Alvin Stenros of Finland, who won grueling race year before. Mrs. G. Henry Stetson has support of gallery at Marion, Pennsylvania Golf Links, October 2nd, 1926, as she tees off in finals of Women's National Golf Tourney. Her opponent is Mrs. W.D. Goss, and on 35th Green, two golfing mothers bring match to a close. Three up and one to go, winner is Mrs. Stetson, shown here with her two daughters. Bringing up children doesn't deter Mother Stetson from bringing home the bacon, too. It's tennis again. This time, the Davis Cup matches in Boston. America's Richards and Williams meet Francis Brugnon and Cochet in the doubles. It's a spirited match, with Richards and Williams turning on the heat of ball to victory. British ambassador Sir Esme Howard and the winners. Hirohito reigns over land of the rising sun. Illness strikes early during his rule. Shinto priests pray for his speedy return to health. Tokyo's police force comes to pray as police captain receives branch of evergreen, symbol of purity, to place on altar. From Sokol to Formosa, Japan's millions pray for their emperor and their idols here. Hirohito is restored to health and visits seaport of Suruga, where thousands who have never seen emperor are still afraid to look upon him for fear his dazzling brightness will put out their eyes. Japan's Prime Minister, Baron Tanaka, spearheads Hirohito's newly formed cabinet of warlords in shaping of Nippon's policy of imperialism. A new Japan takes shape, blueprinted from what Hirohito saw in his travels through the Western world. These are wings for war. These are Japanese in training for war. This is what Hirohito's journey brought Japan. This is the Nihai Emperor's all high warning to the world that Nippon is a nation of pride and power. On famed white horse, Hirohito in 1937 reviews troops destined to follow triumphs in Manchuria with crushing conquests into deepest China. World-trained troops beat back Chinese defenders as world mourns China's hopeless and unhappy plight. Japanese bombs blast China's open cities and maim or murder thousands of defenseless people. In three years, Nippon's war machine churns China into a smoking shamble. And then, Sunday morning, December 7, 1941, planes from Japanese aircraft carriers point their noses toward Pearl Harbor. These are official Japanese films of that ignoble raid, captured from the eventually defeated Nipponese. Pearl Harbor is sleeping as these planes wing over friendly waters, 
Hickam Field is suddenly below, and from Jap airships, this is what it looked like as our planes took surprise blasting that December day. And this is smoke that towered and mushroomed August 6, 1945, over the atomized remains of Hiroshima. August 15, 1945, from Japanese Diet, an emperor's voice is broadcast for the first time as Hirohito tells his people he will surrender. There's a bronze plaque aboard the battleship Missouri marking the spot where American and Japanese officials put pens to documents of peace. But its proud lettering does not tell the whole story. Two years after surrender, Hirohito is no longer divine. He's honored now only as head of Nippon's royal family, an ordinary man doing what he can to lead his people to a prosperous life in a progressive and peaceful world. Once proud potentate, little Hirohito led his island people toward the darkness of the setting sun. But under America's Douglas MacArthur, Japan's new day may be dawning. Submarine warfare started August 6, 1914, when 10 U-boats swept the North Sea and sank every ship in sight. You are watching actual scenes showing a U-boat in action. The English ship, Netmore, is being shelled by the German sub, which is serviced to complete destruction started by torpedoes. There goes the Netmore. Contrary to general belief, Great Britain had more submarines than Germany at the start of World War I, but by 1917, Kaiser Wilhelm shipyards were in full production of underseas raiders. But back to 1915 and the U-boat warfare. German officers scan papers of a sunken ship as lookouts scout the sea. Another victim, the steamer Parkgate. This time, a surface torpedo was brought into action. A direct hit, and the Parkgate's crew takes to the lifeboats. The Parkgate was one of the 5,408 ships destroyed by U-boats from 1914 through 1918. Watch as British crew members row toward the submarine that destroyed their ship. Taken aboard as prisoners of war, the sailors are to be interned for the duration. As U-boats continue to terrorize the Atlantic waters, Britain experimented with a new type submarine. The one you see in these photographs was steam propelled with collapsible funnels that disappeared into the superstructure when the craft submerged. It was an impractical craft, never placed in mass production. But other Allied anti-U-boat methods were more successful. Camouflage, zigzag courses in sub-infested waters, decoy ships, mine and net barriers, and most effective of all, the convoying of transports and supply ships by death-dealing, low-slung destroyers and sub-chasers. November 11, 1918, saw end of hostilities, and November 20th saw surrender of all Germany's U-boats to the conquering Allies. The war was over, but the submarine, developed in peacetime, took its place with the airplane as a major destructive force. First World War inspires the military motif of this Lady Duff Gordon fashion creation. But other fashions of the year include a suit featuring knee-length jacket and print lining to match military cut blouse, along with a high waistline and ankle-length slightly flared skirt. It's off to the races with this French creation. A striped skirt drawn up to a bustle effect in back, cutaway jacket and wide belt, paste fashion's fanciest frills way back when. Well, if it isn't yesterday's bathing beauties. Wearing, of all things, bathing suits made of fur. Now, girls, don't be cross. Hmm, if it isn't the wild waves, capping as it were, their climaxes. A suit of steel trimmed with ermine. Now the other way around. Ermine with steel trimming. This creation belongs to the Mink Dynasty. Wonder why they wore these. What fur?
and New York's earliest trolleys. But we are going to move to 1916 and a big transit strike looms as thousands of trolley workers decide to walk out unless demands are met by traction companies. Cooper Square Business Center will be hard hit and wire screen trolleys take off to supply transportation. Jitneys make their appearance and Fifth Avenue buses are overloaded as the strike, which started in Westchester, spreads to the heart of the city. 8,000 conductors and motormen march in an attempt to influence public opinion in their behalf. But with non-striking crews operating them, other trolley cars are off down the streets of New York to make sure that Gotham doesn't have to walk just because there's been a walkout. Bandit at the border. Pancho Villa, fabled brigand to almost precipitated war between the United States and Mexico. It's March 9, 1916, and Villa, at the head of 1,500 troops, crosses the border to raid New Mexico. Here is the Mexican marauder whose men killed 17 civilians and eight soldiers in the foray. Repercussions were immediate. Soon the famed Texas Rangers set after Villa and his men. A few of his band were captured, but Villa escaped. These two prisoners from his ragged army remained in American hands, even as official Washington detailed John J. Pershing, then a brigadier general, to the task of bringing in Villa dead or alive. One week after the bandits raid on New Mexico, Pershing took 6,000 men across the Rio Grande to find Pancho Villa. Despite the presence of American fighting men on Mexican soil, Villa, born Dorotheo Arango, was not found. Border towns were militarized, and on April 15th in Parral came the incident that brought action from the Mexican government. A skirmish between our troops and Mexico's in Parral resulted in the death of 40 Mexicans. Despite official protest by Mexican President Carranza, American border towns became regular army centers. Buildings in Texas, Arizona, and New Mexico were armed and the Customs House in Naco, Arizona, barricaded and fortified. With the Mexican army called out, minor outbreaks kept Washington on the alert. In charge of U.S. censorship at the time, the man destined for our highest honors, Douglas MacArthur. But back in Mexico, General Gonzalez of the Carranza forces in June attacked a Pershing scout force. Cavalry quickly answered the challenge. Mexican troops retreated before the American fighting men. Gonzalez withdrew, and a week after these historic pictures were made, Villa fled to the hills. The United States was to spend a total of $130 million in vain effort to apprehend the bandit chief who was to meet death in an ambush July 18, 1923. By November 1916, all that remained for a complete cessation of hostilities was signing of a protocol which resulted in the exchange of prisoners shown here. These captured Mexicans are about to be returned to their homeland. America's Negro battalions returned to El Paso. Once again, Mexico and the United States are neighbors in peace as Mexican officers join ours to watch our troops return. Secretary of the Treasury Mellon and Assistant Secretary Bond examine new United States currency, which to save paper and conserve vault space has been reduced practically a third in size. The old bill, three and one-eighths by seven and a half inches, and the new bill, two and five-eighths by six and three-sixteenths. Big Bill and his kid brother, Small William. Preparations are made to ship the bills to Federal Reserve distribution centers, and within a year, the old bills ought to practically disappear. Just in case you haven't seen any lately, here are the smaller bills, Washington on the one, Jefferson on the two, Lincoln on the five, Hamilton on the 10, Jackson on the 20, U.S. Grant on the 50, Franklin on the 100, McKinley on the 500, Cleveland on the 1,000, Madison on the 5,000, and appropriately enough, Chase the 10,000. San Francisco Splash. It's September 6, 1927, bad day for two world swimming records at Far Western Championship meet. First record buster is backstroke expert George Kojak of New York Boys Club. 
as he thrills excited crowd watching him dash to new record for his event. Time, two minutes, 40 and two fifth seconds. George Kojak, king of the backstroke artists. And following the New Yorker's lead, Johnny Weissmuller knifes through pool to set his startling record for 100 yard freestyle. Johnny Weissmuller, destined for motion picture fame. Let's go south in 1927 to watch Pete Desjardins, national diving champ, in a full twist. Pete in a layout half gainer, followed by a jackknife version of the same dive. The swan dive. Champion for three years, Pete now does the difficult two and a half. Then the front one and a half with a new twist. It's 1927, and Los Angeles decides to select the most beautiful back in a bathing suit. This judging racket is a ticklish business. Just a case of touch and go. Get giggly, I guess. Oh, well. The winner, the girl with the most beautiful back from way back. Primrose House proprietor. Here in middle 1920s is Mrs. Governor Morris, going into the business beautiful, the beauty business. And here's a coy client who thinks beauty is, as a socialite wife of writer Morris does. She's properly attired in the droopy drape of the time, but her face is out of fashion, so she's come to Primrose House for a bit of professional care. This would feel good in any year. Now, let's have a look at our remodeled client. Thank you very much. Now, you thank Mrs. Morris. Good scout and great with needle and thread. Not happy with regimented headgear and who is, these Girl Scouts, 1927 variety, decide they'll make their own. Here they are wearing look-alikes. Then it's hats off and on again. But now it's to each her own hat. Seems very type is outnumbered three to one in popularity, and how to become popular model in 1927 is demonstrated by these strutting scouts. All those who want careers as models nowadays, please turn the other way. July 6, 1927, and in Detroit, Michigan, five balloons prepare for annual race, important event of the time. First air ball takes off and the race is on. Happy landings, wherever you come down. Here's Detroit 2, eventual winner of contest. Pilot is Sven Rasmussen, who lands his windblown craft in Kingston, North Carolina, for new record of 508 miles. Spectators across nation watched for contesting balloons from massive open-top touring cars while driving down dusty roads and gravel highways. Here goes the winner with almost 26 hours of flight ahead of it before it comes again to Earth. It's a great event in a great year for aviation, for it was only a few weeks ago that Lindy flew the Atlantic. Hi, Jinx in a Harlem dance hall. It's 1927, and the spirit of Charles Lindbergh's recent leap of the Atlantic is cause of this ballroom bone bending. It's the Lindy Hop, before old age crept up on it and toned it down. Here it is being demonstrated by some of its rubber-boned originators. That's dancing. That's dancing, the Lindy Hop. High over rooftop of Hotel Belvedere is Shipwreck Kelly. It's August 29th, 1927, and high in rain-swept Manhattan skies, famed flagpole sitter has vowed he'll hold his perch for as many hours as it took Lindbergh to fly across Atlantic. But weather during night gets rougher than ocean storm. After 13 hours, 13 minutes aloft, he's down, a wiser and certainly wetter flagpole sitting king. Provincetown, Massachusetts, and first efforts are made to raise the submarine S-4, sunk in collision December 17th. Rescue work made extremely difficult by heavy seas, divers come back to the salvage ship Fountain after fastening lines around the stricken sub. All hope has been abandoned for the 42 men on board, but work to salvage the ship under U.S. Navy direction must go on. 
Pontoons are to be attached to the S-4 as it lies under seas, and Secretary of the Navy Wilbur, aboard the Falcon, congratulates the divers on the accomplishment of that difficult mission. As pontoons are moved into position, all eyes will be on the surface of the water. Air has been pumped in, and the pontoons come to the surface, bringing with them the first view of the S-4 since it crashed into the destroyer falling and tore a huge gap in its side. The submarine will be towed to Charleston Navy Yard in Boston by the USS Sagamore, standing by while these pictures were being taken. Aboard the USS Sagamore, preparations are made to tow the S-4, with Provincetown waters rising in protest. Finally, the trip to Charleston is made, and the convoy enters Boston Harbor, where the submarine will be reclaimed. Here is the S-4 in dry dock, with the gaping hole at its side, mute testimony to its death blow. Aboard the USS Bushnell, honors are paid to the sailor victims of the disaster, but the decks of the Navy ship cleared for the last rites. As the Navy pays homage to its men, an official investigation board is in session in Charleston. Members of the board include Rear Admirals Jackson, Latimer, and Captain Ogan, who hear counsel for relatives of the men lost aboard the S-4. In New London, Connecticut, months later, aboard the rebuilt S-4, a new rescue lung to be used by men evacuating sunken submarines is demonstrated. Along with the rescue lung is a new escape lock. Born of the episode which cost 42 lives, these new developments are to prevent repetition of the disaster in the years to come. It's 1923, and here at Long Beach, California, bearded Albert DeWinton shows what it means to be tied up in work. To give him higher hop for drop into the drink, railroad bridge is raised. Look closely among girders of rising structure, and you'll see handcuffed and bound to Winton, ready for the jump. And now, jumping. And here's the self-styled wonder backstroking toward the beach. Hey, what happened to that rope and those handcuffs? And the suit? Well, he didn't lose his head or his hat. In Chicago, strongman Ricardo Nelson does tricks. Fighting off more than he can chew, Nelson bends a horseshoe with his mighty molars. Just think what he could have done to the horse. Here's Nelson's idea of how to share a telephone book with your friends. Strong man with plenty of pull. It's 1929 and Sailor Sandow, 155 pounds of muscle, pulls 6,000 pounds of heavily loaded car. My grandpa, what great big muscles you have. Music maestro, police. It's 1923. The musician is Henry Cowell, the instrument is a piano, and the music is fantastic. But it was anything to be different in those days. This is called Dempsey Diapason. And in case Henry's technique is too fast for you, here it is, slow down. Oh, it looks pretty, doesn't it? The audience should take a bow for listening. At Pendleton, Oregon, 23rd of September, 1923, ex-secretary William McAdoo gives Roosevelt Trophy to cowboy Yakima Canute. Winner of best all-around cowboy at show, Canute shows his world championship form in bucking horse event. He's up, he's down, he's up, he's down, he's up, he's down, up, down, up, down. Oh, he's always in the saddle. Rolling Stacks. Here in poor districts outside Evanston, Illinois, is Library on Wheels, designed to bring reading matter to suburban children who can get into town to improve their minds. It's 1923 and something new in education. This is a good idea today, too, for those of us who can't get that book back to the library in time.
Maybe this is the book of the Trip Club. British authoress Eleanor Glynn, writer of It and creator of the It Girl, gets creation by local florist on visit to America in early 1920s. Describing herself as high priestess of the god of love, Miss Glynn wrote best-selling novels and a long list of short stories over a span of 20 years. But three weeks in 1907 and It in 1927 were most famous. French druggist Emile Couet, father of philosophy of self-help for the sick. Quitting his drugstore early in 1900s, Couet opened clinic at Nancy in 1910. Here, chief medicine was for patient to repeat Fane's statement, every day in every way, I'm getting better and better. It's December 22nd, 1923, and actress Mary Hay, who head cast of Mary Jane, first play on new theater boards, climbs to marquee of New York's Imperial Theater and christens Sane. Well, almost. Soft marquee or tough bottle. Ah, third strike is the charm. The charming Miss Hay soon makes hay for the Imperial with stage performance that's instant hit. The Brothers Musel in 1923. Though needing no introduction to baseball's fans and pitchers, they're Emil of the Giants and Bob of the New York Yankees. While brothers under the uniform, they were rivals in World Series games of 1921, 2, and 3. In early 1920s, the really stylish young lady had a feather in her hat if she wore such frills as these on her cap. Knee cap, that is. Closer looks show the flower of American womanhood in all its glory. This she wore so she could show her torso, more so. This is cute, uh, isn't it? The curtain is up for the show, primarily to show the artist his handiwork. Who else wants to see it? Well, you must admit the artwork is nice, but why waste art on canvas in such condition as this? Well, maybe they were beautiful then. Here in Boston in 1923, this local belle is about to be crowned with a crop of curls, but not without first being forced to wear this halo of horror. It's brand new device for producing permanent waves by hot air. And this wig of wigglers is the result. After a few finishing touches, the top beauties of 1923 topped their beauty thus.